Evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, tonight we've got um, Dr. Alison Bond from Romenco. Are you there, Alison? Looking I very am. festive. I'm, I'm Christmassy as well. Look. <laughs> very good. Very good. How are you tonight? I'm good, I'm thank good, you. Thank you. Good. How are you? Okay. Good, good thanks. Good. So Alison is Romenco's technical ma services manager and has been with them for 16 years. Um, prior to that, she did a PhD in dairy nutrition at Harper Adams. And she knows so much about ruminant nutrition analysis. She's really good. We're in for a good evening. Um, yeah, really important to, to get this nutrition right with the with the price of lambs at the moment. When I was looking at the John Nix Farm Management Handbook, the difference between the best performers and the worst performers was the difference of £49 gross margin per you. That's a big gap. So whatever we do to fill that has to be good. So tonight, um, you're all on mute, but if you want to ask any questions, uh, if you look at the top right-hand bar next to the person with a hand up, there is a, a speech bubble. If you type your questions there, we'll... Um, We'll, we'll make, I'll make sure that uh, Alison gets to read them. So, Alison, over to you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank Thanks. you. Um, I'm going to now attempt to share my screen. Let's put it into presentation mode. There we go. Yeah, brilliant. OK. Um, yeah, so thanks, um, Rod and Tom, for inviting me. It's, it's really good to, to come and have a chat with you guys. Um, and like Rod said, we're going to be looking at um, improving that you nutrition this this time. So um, what I want to begin with is is looking at our U. Um, we're well past topping season now, but now is not the time to take our finger off the pulse. This mid pregnancy period through to the approach to lambing is equally important. And we'll look in more detail at this period. We'll look at what's going on uh, in our U uh, and how we can perhaps help her. We'll move on to look at those pre-lambing requirements then as we get that closer to that all important date um, and focus in particular on the importance of forage and understanding what you've got on farm this year um, and getting the most from it. And then finally, we'll just very quickly touch on the benefits of, of using a supplement over this period as well. Oh, there we go. So as I've mentioned, I think it'd be fair to say that topping's well and truly done. Um, our, our use should be in lamb now. Um, but it's probably a good place to start for this evening. We know that it's a really key period in the sheep calendar, that ewe fertility is the main driver affecting our output of our sheep flock. And it's, it's this output, um, in other words, our lambs are produced, that will affect our financial bottom line. So broadly speaking, when we talk about tupping, we look initially at that far off tupping period, and that can begin at weaning. And then we look at the tupping period itself through to that early pregnancy when the um, pregnancy is establishing itself. Once we reach the mid-pregnancy period, which we define as, as being that day 30 onwards, um, then pregnancy is said to be well established. Um, but we um, we really don't need, we really haven't got time to, to step back. Um, I think historically we've perhaps gone okay, right? That's it now till uh, till pre-lambing. I'm just going to let this you crack on. But as we can see from this diagram, which I've taken from AHDB's feeding the U, we're we're starting to understand better through projects like Challenge Sheep the link between all the different parts of the sheep production calendar. So, so actually, even sort of like body condition score at weaning can really affect um, lambing percentage and and all sorts of things. So, um, I think it's really important that even through this mid-pregnancy period, we still keep an eye on on what's going on. So, so what is going on? Um, so, like I say, mid-pregnancy around day thirty to ninety. In, into that pregnancy. And during this time, that's when that placenta will, will start to develop. Now, the placenta is, is responsible for supplying its nutrients to the developing fetus. And actually, ruminants are quite unique. Um, and this is my useless fact for the evening, because they have what we is known as a cotyledonary placenta, which means instead of having one big placenta, like we perhaps think of in, in humans, they have a lot of smaller placentae. In fact, they have between 75 and 125 of these little placentae and they have caruncles, which if I can put my laser on, I can show you these little. It's like round thickenings on the uterine mucosa on the maternal side, and they form attachments with the fetal membranes through these cot cotyledons. And this allows nutrients to pass through to the fetus from from mum and they fasten it a little bit like poppers that's that's the way to think of them but like I say 75 to 125 of those developing now if they don't develop 
completely during this mid-pregnancy stage of pregnancy. There'll be detrimental effects on lamb birth weight because the baby lamb's not going to get the nutrition it needs. Even potentially subsequent sub survival and growth rates. Um, there's you know higher new mortality for lambs following maternal undernutrition in, in mid-pregnancy. It's also really important to think about the future of that lamb that's developing as well, because it's during this kind of mid-pregnancy stage that it's um, reproductive organs will start to develop as well. So actually we're, we're talking quite far down the line, but a female um, fetal is, is developing its ovaries and, and all that in this mid-pregnancy time. And if we don't get the nutrition right during this time, then, then we may affect that long-term production of, that, of that, that lamb that's not even been born yet. So to help ensure that good placental development, we should be managing body condition score. And I like to talk a lot about body condition score. Um, we should have reached our target by tupping time. Um, and if not, we should be still working towards, towards getting towards that target. Um, recent work has demonstrated that actually improvements in scanning percentage have been seen when ewes actually continue to gain weight and body condition score in the period from from mating through to scanning. So in other words, this mid-pregnancy time that we're talking about this evening. So this would suggest that maybe we should be looking when we're feeding our ewe at this time and maybe a little bit of an increase over that maintenance that we've perhaps looked at in the past. Um, and I think this goes against previous thinking. Historically, we would have talked about maybe losing half a body condition score during this time. Um, but actually what this new Challenge Sheep project and this work is showing is that there's, there's really no benefit from doing that. In fact, it can be detrimental. And like I say, this undernutrition during mid-pregnancy can affect long-term production of, of our lambs. So what I've got here, and hopefully it'll work, is I want to show you, I'm just going to reshare because I need to put the sound on this. So, right. Ah, I don't know if that's going to work. I've got a video here, but I don't think. Right. OK, let's try again. I need to put the sound on so you can hear the video. Ah, right. There we go. OK, so I've got a video here that one of my colleagues um, put together for us on on body condition score. Uh, and it's not going to let me play it now, is it? That's typical. After all that. OK, right. Well, that's fine. I had a backup plan in case. You in this short video, I will explain how to body condition that's score typical, use. But there's no picture. Why is that not working? OK, I'm going to move on. I'm not going to get. Hi, anything. I'm Emily Hall, technical specialist at NetEd. <laughs> Today we're going to talk to you about body condition scoring, how to body condition score your sheep and also hopefully show you how easy it is to body condition <laughs> score your flock yourself. So when we're body condition scoring sheep, we need to make sure that we get hands on and preferably by the same person each time. This is because wool growth at certain times of the year can be quite deceiving of fat cover. So therefore, it's really important that we get hands on with the sheep. So when we are body condition scoring sheep, we want to focus on two key areas. The first area is a spinous process and the second area is a transverse process. The spinous process is this along here and the transverse process down the side by here. We want to assess the level of fat cover over these two areas. Body condition score is measured on a scale between one and five. One being very thin with very little fat cover and five being very fat with lots of fat cover. Half scores are often used too. Gently place your hands over the spinous and the transverse processes nah. to assess the level of fat cover. If it is really easy to feel the bones of the spine and the transverse processes, this may indicate that the U is on the lower end of the scale. However, if on the spinous and the transverse processes you can feel the spine with a little pressure, this may indicate that the U is towards the middle of the scale. It's very unlikely that a U in a commercial flock is going to be a body condition score of five, as if she is working hard and rearing lambs, she will not be that fat. Once you have body condition scored all of your ewes, they can be put into management groups, which will allow you to have better control over the feeding regime. This will allow ewes who are under condition to gain body condition score, or ewes in the correct body condition score to maintain condition, or ewes that are over fat to lose body condition score, so that they are at the target body condition score for the time of the production cycle. Perfect. 
perfect. So hopefully you could all hear that, but I will share that link with uh, with Rod and Tom, and then they can drop it onto their uh, onto their Facebook page if they wanted to. But one equivalent one condition score is equivalent to about ten to thirteen percent of body weight. Um, so our seventy kilo U this equates to around seven to nine kilos of weight. Um, that they maybe need to lose or or gain depending on on their condition. So um, this was my backup plan, but actually now we got to see Emily, we can skip straight through that one. So this regular conditioning um, and acting on these results will, will help increase the performance of any flock. And if I was sat in a room with you now, I'd be asking you to pop your hands up and let me know how many of you condition score and then how many of you actually action that and, and do stuff with that information. It's a really good indication of the nutritional well-being of our animal. And, and it just ensures that we're on target for the system, for the time of year. And then as a result, it can help to improve fertility, increase lamb performance and, and reduce any incidence of, of metabolic disease. So that body condition scoring at key stages of the production cycle is, is, like I say, quite an appropriate performance indicator to actually predict our weaned lamb weight as well. So there's some nice data showing positive correlations with the weight of our lamb weaned with body condition score at mating, weight gain from weaning to mating, body condition score at scanning, and even body condition score at lambing as well. So it's really important to, um, to be keeping an eye on that and that body condition score. Uh, and I would recommend, you know, getting them to target at topping time and then body condition scoring again, perhaps when you bring them into scan, just to make sure that they've not lost, they've not gained, that they're where they need to be. And then maybe again, six, six weeks pre-lambing. So let's not forget our trace elements. They're also very important during that early and through into, into mid-pregnancy. Um, this work here that I've got up on the screen is, is some quite old work. And, and if you've heard me speak before, you'll have seen me show it before because um, I quite like it. I think it demonstrates really nicely the benefits of cobalt. So what we've got here is um, two groups of animals fed either a high cobalt diet or a low cobalt diet. And they were fed this cobalt, mum was fed this cobalt um, during early stages of pregnancy. And what we can see is that those ewes that were fed a higher level of cobalt um, had much more active lambs. So when the lambs came to be born that later on period, um, they were up, they were active, they explored, they nosed mum more, they had more curiosity, which would suggest they were probably going to take more milk on and then they get going that little bit quicker. So, you know, demonstrates quite nicely the importance of cobalt. But let's not all also forget the importance of things like selenium and vitamin E, which can be associated with increased embryo loss. Um, and this is aside from, you know, an animal's maintenance, mineral and vitamin requirements that they need just on a on a day to day basis. Alison, what's the difference in Kerbal between the two groups there? Do you know that what not, the difference was? I'm not sure. I would have to no. dig the work out. I've got the work. I can dig it out for you. But um yeah. So obviously the, the lighter blue was is with more cobalt and yeah, it's yes. just interesting to see the behavior in the lamb really. Yeah, Very de interesting. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And and what really fascinates me is the effect that that's having on on the lamb at the end of the pregnancy, obviously, but this is looking at what that was fed early on. Um and I think I don't think we give that enough thought really as to what's going on quite early on in the pregnancy and how we can influence later on. So I think during this period, it would be quite normal to to, to scan as well. Um, and again, this is quite an important tool to help manage groups, um, perhaps as you move through into later pregnancy. Like I say, it's a good opportunity to, to put your hand on, on the back of these ewes again, just make sure they're still on target, make sure they're not gaining too much or losing too much. Um, and then make sure that you use that scanning information it can be useful to, to adjust those groups. You can take out any empty use. You can look at your grazing requirements, the forage you've got. You can start working out what you're going to need. Um, and if possible, it might be worth being able to pull out some of those triplet and, and twin bearing use who, who are going to have those higher requirements as we get that little bit closer to lambing. Um, and depending on, on the forage available and the season, it might be worth considering supplementing as, as early as mid-pregnancy. Um, you know, a molasses lick of some description is ideal for supplementing um, forage, help topping up that energy and protein, especially if you've identified use within your group that perhaps need that little bit of extra help. Um, the energy requirement for maintenance during mid-pregnancy is about 12% of body weight. So our 70 kilo U, she's going to need about eight and a half megajoules of energy per day. Um, but her maximum dry matter intake is around 2% of body weight. So again, 70 kilo U, that's about one and a half kilos dry matter per day. So 
if you've got a 10 me grass um you know on, on a dry matter basis our ewe needs to eat about 840 grams of that to get her eight and a half um, megajoules but if we assume that at this time of year that grass could be 14 percent dry matter you know it's very very wet then she's going to need to eat about six kilos of that fresh grass just to hit her maintenance requirements so if you've got a ewe that's that's needing that little bit extra or you've not got that grass in front of you then that's when you perhaps need to think about putting up something in there just to to top up that that um that grazing Alison, and, we've got our first our first question has just come in. Um, yeah. If you if you are going to be in better body condition right through to lambing, will this lead to more problems with prolapse, especially if there is more internal fat? Potentially, yeah. Prolapse, twin lamb disease, um, they can all be all, all be issues, um, especially if they are too fat. So anything that's above about three and a half body condition score. Um, you need to perhaps be now's the time in that mid pregnancy to to slim them down. Um, you don't want them losing too much condition because that will put them on a risk of twin lamb from the other side. Um, but perhaps if you've got some poorer grazing that you can put them on for a little bit just to get them down below that that condition score three and a half. So again, that's why it's really important to to, to be on this. And I think there's I think it'd be fair to say there's quite a lot of grass out there. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would imagine the quality is dropping away quite quickly now. We've had some quite heavy frosts, um, but up to now we've had quite a lot of grass and I think ewes are looking pretty healthy at the moment. Um, so, yeah, that body condition score works both, both ways. OK, thank you. Um, so in terms of using supplements, we know that homegrown forages and grass, this is the, the cheapest way to produce our, our milk and meat. Um, but we also know that certain times of the year, like we've just talked about, um, it perhaps doesn't offer everything that it needs to. So it's important to offer these supplements to try and top up energy, protein and, and take into consideration the minerals, vitamins and trace elements as well. They help to make good any deficiencies as, as well as supplying these extra nutrients that might be needed. Um, we know that they can help manipulate grazing and make better use of grazing pasture as well. So what we've seen is when supplements are put out, animals tend to graze further um, and, and graze better. They get more out of that forage as well. Um, we know that this little and often feeding you get from feeding supplements is, is a very natural um, way of feeding animals with rumens um, and it just helps promote rumen, um, rumen health we also see the availability of feed 24 seven, which helps prevent bullying. It means um, animals tend to be more calmer. If you do go in with hard feed, they're not not so rushing at you. And it's a nice, convenient and labour time saving way of putting minerals and vitamins and trace elements to these animals as well. So, so don't rule it out as an option if if perhaps your grazing isn't quite up to it over over this mid pregnancy period. We then move on into into later pregnancy um, and this would be you know that last six to eight weeks so day 90 through to to 145 um, and this is a really important time as well we know that that in lambing time is responsible for up to 75 percent of ewe deaths so three quarters of, of our ewes that die are dying around the lambing time and usually within a couple of days of giving birth similarly 70 percent of our lamb deaths occur at this time as well so so we really need to be on it. Um, we need to be, you know, making sure that we're we're on top of things um, to reduce those deaths on farm. During this period, 70% of the fetal growth is occurring. And this is demonstrated down in the bottom graph here where we've got this blue line demonstrating our lamb growth. And as you can see from, from six weeks pre-lambing, it really, really takes off. So around eight weeks pre-lambing, our fetus weighs about 800 grams. Um, and then obviously your newborn lamb is going to weigh somewhere between four, four and a half kilos. So it's got a lot of growing to do in that last six weeks. Um, and that huge amount of growing is going to put quite a big stress on our ewe. She's going to be pulling large amounts of nutrients from her diet and protein, energy um, and putting that towards that lamb growth. It's during this time that our udder also starts to develop. So she starts to lay down her colostrum as well um, and that colostrum quality is really important that first feed for that lamb it gets up it suckles it's away um, and we really want good quality colostrum as well so as i've mentioned that use energy and protein requirement will be increasing rapidly it'll be more than doubling for a ewe that's carrying twins um, but as that lamb grows or those lambs grow inside of her they're taking up space inside as well they're, they're squashing her rumen so her appetite is going to be reducing by about 30 percent 
So it's a really important time to be looking at that diet and making sure that you're feeding the most nutrient dense diet you can to, to make sure that she can keep pace with that with that fetal growth. And um, this is one of my favorite diagrams to, to put up and it's it's old, old now, um, but it just shows how important it is to um, to understand that rumen and those lambs that are growing. So here on the left, we've got a barren ewe, and this is her rumen, so taking up sort of two thirds of her abdominal space. Um, over here, we've got our, our twin bearing ewe, she's at 100 days gestation, so maybe around seven weeks pre-lambing. Um, and you can see here her lambs along the bottom here, she's, she, her twin lambs are in there, and they are really pushing up onto that room and really squashing that space. Um, so like I say, whilst her nutritional requirements are, are increasing, her ability to eat is decreasing by the day. So our key message really for this time is that our intake is reducing at a time when she has even greater demands for energy and, and nutrients. And again, this is this is demonstrated quite nicely in this diagram. So this red line here is demonstrating her energy requirements. So you can see again, as we get towards the end of that pregnancy, that energy requirement is just taking off. But this blue line here, this blue line demonstrates her dry matter intake. So you can see that's just literally dropping away. So what we have here is this green space, which um, which we call negative energy balance. And, and interestingly, we talk about things like negative energy balance when we talk about high yielding dairy cows. Now, really, our sheep, she is the equivalent. If, if you work back in terms of percentage body weight and the lamb she's producing, the milk she's producing, she really is a high yielding dairy cow and we should be looking after her that way. So what we're really trying to do in this last six weeks is we're trying to minimise this. We're trying to squash this space. We're trying to give her a, a more nutrient dense diet so that actually we, we minimise the issues that, that we're going to see here. So what we're trying to do really from mid-pregnancy on, a um, couple of aims in mind, we're trying to maintain that body condition score, um, reduce if we need to, if they're, if they're too fat, but really, really try and, and, and maintain. Um, we've seen the importance already of, of body condition score, and we know the, the role it's playing in terms of placenta um, placenta development, um, and, and we've talked about the detrimental effects that that can have on lamb birth weight. We also need to um, look at the reducing the risk of metabolic diseases, such as things like twin lamb. There's, there's kind of different reasons why twin lamb ends up occurring. We've talked about a ewe being too fat, but there could be a ewe that's not getting enough energy. So she's in this negative energy balance that can also cause twin lamb when she's starting to burn that, that body fat to, to produce energy. There's the ewe that's perhaps got other underlying health issues, um, but we need to support her as best we can. We also need to support the unborn lamb by making sure our ewe can produce good quality colostrum. This will help um, that lamb get off to the, the best possible start in life. So let's move on to look at uh, the base of our ewe's diet now as we're coming up to lambing time. So our key ingredient will almost always be some kind of forage, um, whether it be grazing if you're later lambing and they're outside, or whether it be some kind of preserved forage, silage or hay. We know forage is the cheapest feed on farm, so we really need to be basing our diets around this key ingredient and absolutely maximising these forage intakes. It's the really, it's the healthiest way to feed the stock. It helps maintain the rumen health, rumen pH. So we just need to, we un need to understand what we've got there available on farm um, and then we need to balance accordingly. So this table here demonstrates the kind of ideal silage for, for sheep. So sheep actually like relatively dry, well-made silage, and this helps to ensure that optimum intake. The better quality, the more that you can eat. So in late lactation, she'll eat between two and two and a half percent of her body weight in dry matter. So as we discussed earlier, this is about one and a half to one, one and three quarters of a kilo in, in dry matter. And at least 60 percent of this should be from forage, which is about a kilo. So she needs to be eating about a kilo of a really good quality forage in that last six weeks. And like I say, the better the quality, the more nutrition she's going to get from that kilo dry matter. And as we've mentioned, as our ewe approaches lambing, we want to offer that best forage. Um, that rumen capacity is compromised. We've seen that really great image. And we can see here, this table shows us how much forage a ewe can eat. And what we can see is that as the forage quality improves, you can see as we go from straw up here with maybe a six and a half ME and up to your very good silage at 11 and a half, you can see actually the amount, the percent of body weight that she can eat from forage increases quite a lot. 
So in other words, a larger percentage of her body weight is, is being eaten as forage. Um, so really the key is here, if you've got it and you can, um, feed and save your good quality forage for those last weeks of, of pregnancy to, to help maximise those, those intakes. How else might we be able to maximise intakes? Um, this was research undertaken in Ireland a few years ago, and it actually demonstrates how the presentation of our silage can affect the amount of cake needed to be fed to our ewes. So these meal feeding requirements here is the amount of cake that was fed over the last six weeks to, to twin bearing ewes. Down here, we've got the dry matter digestibility of the ad lib silage. Um, so what you can see is that when we precision chopped, or we, I didn't, I wasn't there, but when they precision chopped the, um, the silage, you can see actually that they needed to feed less cake, probably because the ewes were eating more of the forage. Um, obviously, chopping bales is, is not always possible. It's, it's not going to work for everybody. Um, but really, it's about making sure that there's plenty of access to, to, to allow intakes, to allow sheep to stand and eat the forage for as long as they need to. So plenty of feed space per ewe. Um, maybe consider grouping animals separately to give them that opportunity to feed as they need. So, so maybe if you haven't scanned, maybe just group them according to body condition score or, or age, making sure that those younger animals that can be a bit more vulnerable can perhaps um, can feed away from, from the older animals. And don't forget water as well. Water really drives intakes uh, and use on dry diets may need up to four and a half litres of water per day. Whilst obviously if you've got a moisture silage, then they, they won't take in so much. So again, this is an example I, I quite like demonstrating the, the benefit really and the importance of actually understanding your forage. So I would urge everybody to get their silage or their forage or their hay analysed. Um, we can do it for you at Romenco through RM Jones, but most sort of feed companies will, will do it for you. Um, and it's really worth doing. And this year in particular, with compound prices being at that little bit higher, input costs being that bit higher, then it's worth knowing what you exactly you've got on farm. So what this example is showing is, it's again, we're using our 70 kilo U. She's carrying twins and she's three weeks off lambing. So we know from book values that she needs about 15.3 megajoules. Now, just for ease, if we um, assume that she eats a kilo of forage on, on a dry matter basis, our 9.7 me grass silage, she's going to need a little bit extra on top of there. She's going to need 5.6 megajoules extra per day to meet her energy requirements. So this this could be provided from a, a sort of 450 grams of cake, assuming a 12 and a half ME. However, if our silage is actually 11.1 ME, um, she only needs 4.2 megajoules to, to meet her 15.3. So she can be fed 100 grams compound less per day. Um, now, over 100 ewes over three weeks, this is nearly a, a quarter of a tonne just by actually understanding and knowing what exactly you've got on farm. So rather than just feeding what you've always fed, whether it be a pound or half a pound, really look at it this year and really understand what you've what you've got on farm uh, and then work it back from there in terms of, of what you're going to be needing. So just looking at how our forages are looking this year, um, it was a reasonably, if we cast our minds back to, to harvest, um, and, and chopping time, we had a reasonably extended and inconsistent harvest, in particular for some of those first cuts. Um, I think it would be fair to say that certainly around here and in North Shropshire, people either went before the rain or they left it and went after the rain. And, and the, the, what we're seeing is some really variable quality throughout. It's not necessarily poor, it's just really quite variable. Um, we're seeing perhaps lower lower crude proteins, lower proteins, which which could be problematic. Protein in that late pregnancy is really important for, for putting on milk and colostrum. So again, it might be that you need to top up with a little bit of soya protein or, or something like that. We're also seeing some quite high fibres as well, so quite fibrous forages. So again, you know, palatability, ability to intake um, might might be difficult. So it just again emphasising that importance of, of really understanding what you've got on farm this year. And then just looking at some of those minerals as well. So um, the macro minerals, which are your majors, so the things like calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, um, they all tend to be a little bit lower this year, except phosphorus. Um, and it, they think it was probably that cold, wet conditions which affected that grass growth early May. So we had some really nice early spring weather and then the weather just changed and it went really cold and really wet and really horrible um, and it kind of stunted that growth. 
So we think that's probably probably why we've seen that lower levels and it's a similar story for your trace elements as well so your your cobalts your iodines your zinc um those levels seem to be a little bit lower this year and again this dilution um of elements as well so so it might even be worth having a mineral forage analysis done if you've not had one done for a number of years perhaps consider doing that and just making sure that you've got no no deficiencies there So again, we sort of talked a little bit uh, a couple of slides ago about supplementation. Um, we are continually pushing our stock harder. We're asking them to do more from less, um, and it, therefore it's going to become increasingly more important to get that balance right and, and really understand the, the diets being fed. Um, we're relying more on homegrown forages and, and feeds, and I think that's great. Um, but we do need to understand that mineral status can be variable. Um, we, in particular, sort of um, weedy pastures used to have really good mineral profiles, but now we're getting better at, at grass growing and pasture rotation and, and reseeding. And actually, these modern grasses have got much lower mineral status in them. So, um, again, you know, we need to be we need to be taking that into consideration. So there's lots of benefits to, to feeding supplements, and I, I've touched on most of these already. Like I say, making better use of the, that grazing pasture, um, that feed availability 24-7, prevents bullying, promotes performance. Um, we know that you know as, as ewes become closer to pregnancy, twin bearing ewes, they don't want to be roughing around at their trough, um, and they do tend to be much calmer if, if there's a block out that they know they can feed from. There's no need for troughs. We can encourage animals to graze further. Um, blocks and buckets are weatherproof time saving, labour saving, um, <clears throat> and they've all got um, a full mineral, vitamin and trace element spec in there as well. So there's no need to add anything else in there, which can be quite important just to just to top up <coughs> one product in particular that, that could work for sort of that mid pregnancy period on through to lambing is the Optilix Energy, um, which is a really nice high energy bucket, 16 ME. It's got a mix of, of proteins in there. It's got 12% protein, but it's got a little bit of urea protein in there as well. So that urea protein will ensure animals can, can make use of the forages they've got, especially if the forages are a bit poorer quality, maybe higher fibre, um, whilst that natural protein that's also in there will help with milk production and, and colostrum. Um, really nice high sugar levels in this product as well. The, the, the way it's manufactured means that it's a really nice hard physical nature uh, with a good level of sugar in there. So that high sugar is going to match the, the degradable protein that you've got in grass at this time of year, help top that up and, and just make sure that animals get a little bit more from it. And like I say, full spec of mins and bits in there too. So my, my take home message really um, for this evening is, is just looking at that um, mid-pregnancy and beyond period, really, as we go through the winter now. Um, during that time, the optimum placental size is being reached. It's absolutely essential for, for lamb production, for good birth weight um, and survival of those lambs. So, so you, I can't emphasise enough the importance of keeping keeping an eye on that body condition score, making sure that you're either, you know, you've hit your target and you're maintaining or, or you know, knocking some off if you need to, but but really getting that right as you get a bit closer to, to the end of pregnancy. If possible, um, scan use and, and use those results to manage the flock. If, you, if you're not scanning, at least do body condition scoring and manage that flock if you can. Pull out the younger ones, animals at risk of things like twin lamb. Um, and understand your forage quality, have it analysed, really know what you've got on farm this year. That's your baseline um, and then top up from there, perhaps with a supplement. And then if you need hard feed um, that, you know, top that up as well. Um, like I say, consider that supplementation to support production this year to help just maintain body condition score, help put, put um, milk on, on the ewes. So thank you again um, for, for having me along and um, please fire away if you've got any questions or anything you want me to to cover off again um yeah great thanks thanks Alice. Some, some good stuff there one question we have is um will the optilix high energy correct the mineral status of the u yeah absolutely should do um it's got a full specification of mins and bits in there all your trace elements and your major elements so there should be no need to to add, add any more supplementation onto onto there yeah, I, I was reading recently that the lambing mortality has stayed at 15 percent over yeah. the last 40 years. It's hardly changed. It's quite surprising that really, isn't it? That with more of this science that you showed tonight, Alison, coming through, we can't do more to improve it. No, and it's. I think that's probably what's driven the Challenge Sheep project. So if any of you have had the chance to or 
are interested, it's worth having a look um, on the internet. So it's been done by AHDB and they're following, they've got challenge sheep flocks and they're following through a number of pregnancies and following those lambs onwards um, and they're working also with some guys in New Zealand as well and they're doing similar work there and, and I've been to a number of quite interesting seminars and stuff during lockdown and, and they're getting some really nice data really trying to understand what's causing these losses um, and how we can manage it better. Yeah so what should be aiming more like five percent rather than fifteen percent? Oh, definitely. Yeah, we shouldn't be losing that number, should we? No, it's, um, no. we? We should be. Yeah. And there, I mean, there's lots going on. There's absolutely lots going on. And you've got the risk of twin lamb. You've got the risk of, of milk fevers and calcium problems and mag problems. And then added to that, you've got the, the weather that can always, you know, what if we had the beast from the east a couple of years ago? And, you know, some of these things are completely out of our hands, but there's quite a lot that's, that is within our hands um, yeah. and some really sort of quite basic management stuff that we can be looking at. Yeah, sure. Cool. Another question. Uh, my hay isn't great. I have, o I have oats and new rolls. Will that give enough energy? Yeah, it should do. What I might be a bit concerned about is the protein, depending on the protein level of your of your ewe nuts. So your oats would, would top up the energy quite nicely. And that's a really nice kind feed as well, because it's quite slowly digestible. So um, sheep really really like oats but I you might need to look at your protein um depending on your unit I'd want to make sure that you've got a good level of sort of um a kind of um good quality protein in there a soya or a rape or something like that to drive um to drive milk production good good are there, are there any more questions ah one more coming through would I be better giving them a TMR style ration to even up feed supply um yeah, I, I know a couple of guys that are doing TMRs um, and that can work quite well. But again, you need to make sure it's well balanced. Um, but it does add a little bit of, you know, it's, it's extra labour for you, isn't it? Um, but if you've got the kit to be able to to mix a, a TMR, then then yes, you you know, it's it's more even for them. Probably, yeah, eat it better. Because I guess with, with the forecast, the, the lamb price is forecast to stay high, I'm told. It's I mean, just, it has been. Yeah. I mean, this time last year with Brexit about to happen, I thought there'd be a crash in lamp. I've been amazed yeah. at at the values this yeah, year. Oh, so, absolutely. but I suppose what we need to take into consideration is the inputs have also gone up. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah. why we need to be really managing what we're doing and making best use of our lower cost inputs like our forages um, so that we can we can afford to to get a bit more out of these lambs, I suppose, sure. when the price is high. Yeah. <laughs> And as you said, do a silage analysis. Know what you're feeding them on the on the on the homegrown forage. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Do it, do it now. Do it, you know, do it while you're away off, and then you've got you can look at all your options and and cost them out. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you, Alison. I can't see any more questions coming in. Um, if anyone has more questions, please contact us at RM Jones, and we can get the mess the, the questions through to Alison. Definitely, um, Alison. Yeah. I'd just like to thank you very much. Very entertaining evening, some, some good science there. Uh, I shall look at those slides again. Thank you very much for joining us and have a great yeah. Christmas. Thank you. Yes, yeah, I hope you all uh, well, have a nice, healthy Christmas and a, and a good new year. Yeah. Okay, good night then. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye.